He was the hottest comedian in the country. Then he mysteriously disappeared. Why Dave Chappelle walked away from $50 million. Nobody knew where he was going. Now that sounds a little crazy. The widely reported rumors. People were saying you were on drugs, you went into a mental institution. What was going on? His first television interview. And the big question, will Dave go back to his show? I can't believe I'm saying it's back. This is what I want to do. Be careful, you're on national television. I'm glad you're here. Everybody wants to know, why'd you walk away? from fifty million dollars well i wasn't walking away from the money yeah i was walking away from the circumstances uh-huh that they were coming with the newfound plateau yeah it takes a while when you punch through uh, to adjust to the atmosphere mm -hmm. it was completely outside of my frame of reference i've been in show business since i was fourteen and uh, i've heard the stories Mm -hmm. of what happens, and I've seen these kinds of things play out in front of me. I mean, you see it before. Look, Mariah Carey made a $100 million deal, and three months later, she's all of a sudden mysteriously crazy. Or Martin Lawrence punches through, and he's waving a gun on the street, screaming, they're trying to kill me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we hear those stories. And it always happens around the time of their career where it seems as though they're crossing over the next plateau. Yeah, yeah. Would you say you lost your mind, sort of? No. No. Not exactly. Okay. Uh, I wasn't crazy, but it, it's incredibly stressful. Yeah. And uh, I felt like in a, in a lot of instances, I was deliberately being put through stress because, uh, you know, when you're a guy that generates money, yeah. people have a vested interest in controlling. And so people were saying, though, that you were on drugs, you lost your mind, you went into a mental institution. What is true, what is not? Not on drugs. Not on drugs. Nah, not for years. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I'm not on drugs. I and you weren't on drugs at the time? No, no, no. not at all, not okay. at all. I'm telling you, I was incredibly stressed out. I was doing sketches that were funny, but socially irresponsible. Hmm. I felt like I was deliberately being encouraged, and I was overwhelmed, so... It's like you're getting flooded with things and you don't pay attention to things like your ethics yeah. or when you get so overwhelmed. It's like you won the lottery and... Explain. Let's say for your handlers, for instance. Yeah. A lot of these people uh, traditionally get paid on percentage basis. The more you work... The more they make. The more they make. Yeah. You make that real money, they lost their minds. I thought they were crazy. Uh-huh. You know, it was like you got to do everything. Yeah. Yeah. So I got all these things, then I got, you know, your own personal problems that get inflamed when this kind of money comes in. And I got to write a show and do the show, and I was overwhelmed, and it was almost like, I don't know, it was almost as if this was happening deliberately. I know all these people be watching TV, that there's a lot of people who will understand exactly what I'm doing. Then there's another group of people who are just fans, like the, the people that, the kind of people that scream, I'm Rick James, be at my concerts. Yeah. That this alone for a different kind of celebrity worship rap, they're going to get something completely different. Completely different. I still haven't gotten to why you just disappeared. So you had that moment, the guy's laughing too much. Was that the tipping point for you? Was that the straw? That was the first tipping point. Okay. And then they put in the paper that I had, uh, pneumonia or God knows what, mm -hmm. it was walking pneumonia because I was walking all over the place. <laughs> uh, I was relaxing. Uh, and then uh, after that, I, I was coming back to the show and uh, then they were like, well, Dave, you know, you should just back up the pneumonia story. And I was like, I'm, you know, that was your thing. I'm not, I'm not backing up a pneumonia story. And then the, the next day, it was in the paper that I had writer's block. Then I knew something was getting ready to get stressful because I hadn't even started writing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it wasn't, I was on the schedule to write. So I was like, what's, you know, what's going on? Are they going to... So these are your people trying to feed... Manipulate me. Sounds like somebody's trying to put young Dave in a compromising position. <laughs> uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. But, you know, okay, so then I got worse. So when I said I'm not going to do it, then all of a sudden it was like, well, now he has 
walk in pneumonia. And then I knew long before I walked, I had considered walking. You had considered? I had considered walking because I went back to work and the vitamin love was gone because it was a real ugly negotiation. The situation where now everybody's taking credit for this and that and the other, it's all, it's just, it was getting ridiculous. And I knew I was going to leave, so I got ahead of schedule and I bounced. And I didn't tell anybody where I was going. The whole time, they're trying to convince me I'm insane. They were trying to get me to take psychotic medication. Yeah. Like I'm sitting around, you know, I was stressed out, but the people that were telling me I was insane, I believe that they knew what was going on. So, uh, this was troublesome. Yeah. I said, I'm not taking this medicine, man, because I know these people be trying to control you. Or, or maybe discredit I was afraid, like, you But know, you were stressed out. That's why... There's no question. Yeah. But it's very stressful for someone to constantly walk behind you and say, you're insane. You got up and you walked out and nobody knew where you were going. Did your family know? Nah, well, no. Nah, I called my brother. Yeah. Me and my brother, real cool, I called him up and was like, uh, I'm going to Africa. He was like, cool, man. It's good. Did your wife and children know where you're going? No. No. Nobody knew. No. I bounced. Now that the, the sounds a little crazy. It's not crazy because the situation kind of warranted it. Okay. Um, because certain people around me were putting my sanity in question, I would meet too much obstruction if I would say I'm doing something like yeah. this. Yeah. Okay. So I figured I, it wasn't that I didn't tell my wife. It was like I'm not telling her. So after I'm gone, which was a mistake, but it wasn't a crazy mistake. It's just a dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just like as a yeah. husband, she should have known where you were gone. Is that what you're saying? She was gonna know. Okay. I, well, you know, I basically I called my brother. I told and I gave him a list. She called so and so and so and so and so and so, and I took off. Then I called my wife. Okay. Right. Why were you going to Africa specifically? One, I needed a break. Need a break. Two, we have family friends down there. And three, I just felt like uh, it was a place where I could really reflect. Mm -hmm. It's just a place that I got to go. And what did you conclude about yourself? Oh, well, that I wasn't paying attention. I felt really guilty about being asleep at the wheel. Mm. I felt guilty about it because uh, I forgot the, the hostility of the environment of show business. It's a, you know, it's not a, a docile environment. It's a challenging environment. Yes. You know, and there's some quote that someone had told me. It says, success takes you where character cannot sustain you. It's not the fame. It's what? It's the way the people around you position themselves around you to get in your pockets and in your mind. Yeah. Colleagues were quoted as saying that you had become uh, increasingly paranoid. Would you say you were paranoid? Sure. You might win a hundred dollars in a poker game and be on the subway. You gonna look over your shoulder? <laughs> they just said in everything. I had fifty million dollars. That's like that's like making me a marked man. So did you go to a psychiatric hospital? All right, who goes from America to Africa for medical attention? <laughs> I cannot imagine. Yeah, yeah. This doesn't sound like the most irresponsible journalism in the world. I cannot imagine yeah. being a journalist and hearing this yeah. from from these people and just running with it. It was on everything. Yeah. As a fact. Okay, so you come back from Africa, Dave, and you are what? Renewed? You feel like you pulled it together? You are still confused? What? Everyone's saying I'm crazy and all this stuff, and it's kind of like, uh oh, I better, I better be seen. So I came back, and I went home, and for like the first two weeks, I was Bigfoot, man. It was like everywhere I went, it was like, there it goes. It was crazy. Or, or like, and then I come home and see the stuff I did that day on the news, like comedian Dave Chappelle was riding his bike. I was like, damn, how did they? And I thought about. All the celebrities I've seen scams. I was like, oh my God, I'm one of these people, man. I'm like one of these people, you know, I tell jokes about people when they scams, everything. 
I was like, I'm the dude right now. Yeah. I'm that guy. And what's so funny about being that guy is when people actually see you, they talk to you like nothing's wrong. Like, hey, man, how are you doing? Well, I'm not crazy. You know, I read something about it. <laughs> you know, it was really weird. Yeah. I would go to work on the show, and I felt awful every day. And that's not the way it was. I felt like some kind of prostitute or something. Like, if I feel so bad, why I keep showing up to this place? I'm going to Africa. The hardest thing to do is to be true to yourself, especially when everybody's watching. Yes, yes. Show business has to do with compromise and wearing the mask. You know, when they say, black folks, we wear that mask. You yeah. walk in that boardroom. It's not like you like you don't walk in the boardroom like what's popping, baby. You know you, you gotta be you gotta put that mask on and you know it's like we're bilingual. We speak job interview and we speak when we speak around each other. You know what I'm saying? Did you feel like a sellout? I felt like they got me in touch with my inner coon. They they stirred him up. Really? When we was doing that sketch and that guy laughed, I felt like man, I, I felt like they got me. They got me. I mean, I'm a conspiracy theorist to a degree. Like, when I, I connect dots that maybe shouldn't be connected, I don't know. But certain dots, like when I see that they put every black man in the movies in a dress at some point in their career, I'll be connecting that dot. Like, why are all these brothers going to wear a dress? This happened to me. I'm doing a movie with Martin. Yeah. The movie's going good. So I walk in a trailer. I'm like, man, this must be the wrong trailer because there's a dress in here. They come in, it's the writer comes in, I think he's the writer, he's like, Dave, listen, we got this hilarious scene where Martin's sneaking out of jail, so he disguises you as a prostitute, <laughs> and he put this dress on, and, huh, what, a prostitute? Nah, I'm not doing that, I don't feel comfortable with that. That, that should have been in a discussion. What? You don't feel comfortable with it? I mean, it's a hilarious bit. All the greats have done it. So, well, if all the greats have done it, it's kind of hacky, right? You're right. So why don't we just not do it? Because I don't feel comfortable wearing a dress. Oh, come on, Dave. Listen, we, we got it all set up. We're supposed to shoot. Every, every minute you waste costs this much money. You know, the pressure comes in. Huh. He said, I'm, now I'm not wearing no dress, man. I'm funnier than a dress. Just give me something funny to say. I don't need to wear no dress to be funny. What am I, Milton Berle? Blah, 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 blah. You know, we're going like this. And then finally he's like, ah. And he, he leaves. And then, like, the director comes, Dave. It really would be great if you wear the dress. What is wrong? What is this? A uh, broke back mountain in here? So, <laughs> so then, <laughs> I wear the, I wear the dress. I don't want to wear the dress. I don't want to wear this dress. You know what I mean? Uh, oh gosh, this guy's so difficult. They leave. Now the producers comes. Come on, David would be so great. I mean, and then I started thinking about it. all the comics that I've seen. Man, you know, strong. Brothers, why, why are they putting us in these dresses? But the minute it was clear, I was adamant, I'm not wearing a dress. I'm not wearing the dress. All right, fine. Think of something else. That comes back ten minutes later. The whole new scene, how, damn, how did you write the scene so fast? <laughs> you know, it's like, so you got to take a stink. It was like a graduation lunch we were having, and they had my dad come and talk to me, and my dad takes me outside, and he's like, listen, and this is... Some advice that applies to all of you acting students. He says, to be an actor is a lonely life. Everybody wants to make it, and you might not make it. And I said to my dad, well, well that depends on what making it is, Dad. He was a smart, smart ass kid. Yeah. It depends on what making it is, Dad. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, you're a teacher. I said, if I can make a teacher salary doing comedy, I think that's better than being a teacher. And he started laughing. He said, if you keep that attitude, I think you should go. He said, but name your price in the beginning. If it ever gets more expensive than the price you name, get out of there. Mm -hmm. Thus, Africa. Yeah, oh, you guys are going to learn a lot tonight. <laughs> what can they learn? You know, like, you guys are students now, so you're idealists, but you don't know about what art and corporate interests meet yet. Just prepare to have your heart broken. <laughs> like, in a way, <laughs> you see him laughing at evil laugh?
<laughs> because he knows, man, and everybody laughs at me, but just get your Africa tickets ready, baby, because it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. You, you have no idea. When Martin Lawrence was in that chair, we talked about Blue Streak. I love that. Too. He played a role in your life, I believe. How do you feel about him as a person, as an artist? Martin Lawrence is the guy that showed everybody you can make it from D.C. to Hollywood. And uh, I had a personal stake in his success. Every time he did something, it made me feel inspired and really good. And he was always real nice to me. He'd sit me down, what's going on with you, baby boy? What, what? We'd talk about comedy, whatever. And, uh, you know, when we did Blue Streak, we were promoting it, and Martin had a stroke. He almost died. And then after that, I saw him, and I was like, oh, my God, Martin, are you okay? And he said, I got the best sleep I ever got in my life. <laughs> That's how tough he is. So let me ask you this. What is happening in Hollywood that a guy that tough will be on the street waving a gun, screaming, they are trying to kill me. Yeah. What's going on? Why is Dave Chappelle going to Africa? Why does Mariah Carey make a $100 million deal and take clothes off on TRL? It, a weak person cannot get to sit here and talk to you. Ain't no weak people talking to you. So what is happening in Hollywood? Nobody knows. The worst thing to call somebody is crazy, is dismissive. I don't understand this person, so they're crazy. That's bullshit. These people are not crazy. They're strong people. Maybe the environment is a little sick. Oh, I'm dropping dimes tonight. <laughs> I've had a long year, Mr. Lippman. We're on our way. What did you mean, Dave, when you described your father's death in 1998 as the beginning of a terrible decline? I was 23 when I was doing Half Baked. I was getting ready to turn 24. And I was going through all the things that a dude goes through when it goes from one level to the next. I was yeah. starring in my, a movie that I wrote. So things start getting crazy around you. Yeah. And my 24th birthday was coming on August the 24th, and I said, this is going to be a big one. And the morning that I turned 24, phone rang, and my sister was like, Dad had a stroke. For the next year, I watched my father teeter on life and death. And it was just all this stuff, man. Like I was, uh, Dad was dying, the half-baked, didn't come out the way I wanted it to come out. I was real upset about that. Because it was a real cool script. And then I saw it, I was like, hey, man, you made a weed movie for kids. <laughs> and it wasn't for kids a script, you know. It was all these things, so much pressure. Africa. Then I, um, <laughs> I was in Ohio. I get a call on my cell phone from Hollywood. I'm like, hello, Hollywood. They're like, hello, Dave. They're like, that pilot you did for Fox, the, looks like they want to pick it up. We need you to come out because they want to meet with you. And I was like, well, listen, I can't really come out right now. I've got a real bad situation at home. Can we talk about this on the phone? No, no, they would rather meet with you in person. Huh. But you know, like the whore that they turned us into, I jumped on that plane and left my father's bedside, which I regret to this day. And I went out and I sat with these people in this room. And if you can imagine a large circle of people, and I was 12 o'clock, the black dude. <laughs> yeah, Dave, we really liked the show, but the, the pilot episode was about me getting booed off stage at the Apollo. They go, you know, but what are we going to do about it? I mean, there's not really any white people in it. So well, it's about the Apollo. It's not really white. Well, you know, we were thinking about the girl on the show. We didn't think she was that funny, not that good looking. I think we should recast her. Maybe, and they start using terms like universal appeal. Mm. Basically saying they want me to recast a girl with a white woman. I say, yeah, I don't think I can do this, and, and, and I quit. On the cover of Variety, Chappelle pulls the race card. The race card. 
and I get calls from Newsweek, 60 Minutes. Everybody, we want your story. <laughs> now I'm scared to death. I'm like Rosa Parks or some <laughs> Like, I'm not ready for this. I was just venting a little bit. Look, man, at, at that point in your life, it, it, it's something so real in contrast to what Hollywood is, a very powerful illusion. And when your dad dies, it kind of just broke the spell, like, oh, this is bullshit. Look, I've been spending so much time doing this. What about my family? What about my friends? Wait, whatever happened to my friends? Damn, I don't even have any friends. Ugh. So I bounce, man. I, I, have, I have not spoken about what, what would make a person walk off the set of a successful show and go to Africa. But again, people don't understand it, so they call me crazy, and I don't like that. What should they understand, Dave? What should they understand? Well, I did two seasons, and it was very easy. Not very easy, but I didn't go to Africa. <laughs> and then suddenly, when I'm getting paid what they said was $50 million, I, it's, I can't do it anymore. Nobody knows. Nobody remembers that I walked away from the show twice last season. Nobody asked about it. Nobody asked about that. You know, in, in uh, one of these magazines, Newsweek, it's a very credible magazine. And they're saying, um, you know, maybe I smoke crack. And it was all innuendo. And, and the magazine as credible as Newsweek, I was very surprised that, that this was happening. And then I got to make some real choices, man. Is that what I want for myself? Did I get too big? Because I like people. I like entertaining. And the higher up I go, for some reason, the less happy I am. You know, is it going to get to the point where I'm doing a strip tease on TRL or waving a gun on the street, <laughs> saying they're trying to kill me? No, I'm not going to let it get to that point. I'm going to go to Africa. I'm gonna find a way to. I'm gonna find a way to be myself. There's only six studios, man. There's only six agencies, man. This is a small, controlled thing, and I don't like having to beg for the spotlight, man. It, the, you know, the machine is good for us, and we good for the machine, and it should be, should be fair, man. It should be fair. What did you find in Africa that was an antidote to that? In Africa, well. A lot of things. First of all, I'm a Muslim. I don't necessarily practice the way I, a, a good Muslim is supposed to practice, but I believe in these tenets. <laughs> and in Africa, there's a small community of people that don't know anything about the work I do, and they just treat me like I'm a regular dude. So I knew that in Africa, I'd have a place to sleep, and that I wouldn't have to feel strange. And, you know, when they would call me crackhead and all these things in the country where I'm from, in Africa, they didn't know anything. They was feeding me and taking care of me and taking me to the mall and just regular stuff. And it just made me feel good. It just reminded me that I was a person, you know. I didn't even know they were saying those things about me. Then I called home and people would be like, oh my God, are you all right? Yeah, chill, I'm in Africa, baby, what's going on? <laughs> and then I got a call from a journalist that had been working on a story, and he was like, yeah, um, rumor mill's going on about you. Just want to clear a few things up. And I'm like, yeah, what's going on? OK, uh, do you smoke crack? I said, what? <laughs> do you smoke crack? Did you graduate from high school? Uh, I mean, it was all these crazy questions. And I thought about never coming back. I said, this, this place is crazy. I'm like, I'm, I'm that dude. I just thought about all the things that celebrities go through. And, what celebrities become in our culture. You know, if you Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston and your marriage is breaking up, that's an awful thing. But to see that speculation in people, gotta sting a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And, you, and then I realized, oh my God, I'm one of those people. That's a small club, man. That's a weird place to be. Ain't really no going back. You can't, you can't get unfamous, you can get infamous. Right. But you can't get unfamous. Right. So I got scared. I'm not going to lie, y'all. I was scared to death. I'm not going to lie, y'all. I was scared to death.
I don't know how this whole Dave Chappelle thing is going to end, but I feel like I'm going to be some kind of parable by either what you're supposed to do or what you're not supposed to so I'm going to be something. I'm either going to be a legend or just that tragic fucking story, but I'm going full throttle. I'm going all the way. <laughs> I want to, I'm, I'm eager to find out how this is, will resolve itself. And one of the things that I wanted to bring up is that Dave Chappelle did an mm. interview a few years back and he specifically said something to the effect of there's this whole idea of like strong people in Hollywood being called crazy and how there's a fine line between being crazy or being a genius, you yeah. know? And he said in particular that I, that stuck out to me was that it takes a strong person to sit in the seat that you're sitting in right now. So right. in our community, we've always admired your honesty and your being so open. What What are your thoughts when it comes to you know, that kind of mindset of like strong people having that kind of platform? Um. <laughs> I got a little deep. <laughs> well, Chappelle's, I guess, the perfect person to discuss that. Mm -hmm. um, the, the fact of the matter is that um, in order to technically be sane, it requires that your belief system go along with everybody else's. And so um, that's why they put such a high modicum on labeling you as that, mm -hmm. just in preparation for what you might later say. Mm -hmm. Just because and, you're different, they always want to kind of put somebody into a box. Well, right. um, that's the shallow end mm -hmm. of it. On the deep end of it, they have an idea that there's a messiah coming and they're not sure who it's going to be. They right. just know it should stick out. So they look every <laughs> time something sticks out to make sure that's not mm -hmm. it. Either way, um, that, uh, genius is relative and it's um, generally better served once you're gone. Right. So the geniuses that we all agree upon, mm -hmm. that's not exactly what they were viewed as right. at the time. There's no way for the guy outside with a kite with keys on it trying to get struck intentionally by lightning. Yeah. There's no way for him not to be crazy mm -hmm. in the current Just because he's different. frame of Absolutely, reference. Absolutely, yeah. We have to see this guy be right enough times that we go, wait a minute, He's he can't be crazy yeah. and right. Yeah. We play a little game of if you only knew. You did not have to answer them, Kat. Excellent. It's not a court, but we'd appreciate your answers. Something you wish you were better at. Dealing with liars. Best perk of being a celebrity. There's no perk to be, come on, Kat. You get online to nightclub, you're gonna perform, you gotta go in first. Yeah, none of that's because of celebrity, as you know, <laughs> Mr. King. Something you long believed to be true, but realized wasn't. Um, well, as one of the uh, main opponents of the Illuminati, I always wanted to know what information they had that we didn't, and I, I found out I was always wondering how our God could have been so thrown off by a story of a tree and fruit. And then I found out that that's not the case at all. Adam was God's son, which means Eve was his daughter. And if they have sex, that ruins everything. And that's what happened. And that's a piece right there.